Okay, so let us continue our discussion of inner product spaces. We have already seen the definition and we have seen uh, three examples also. So let us now start with this next definition, the length of a vector in an inner product space. But before that, the author uh, says something that um, there is no need to write that. Let me just read it out. For the remainder of this section, capital V will denote an inner product space, where of course the underlying field is either the field of real numbers or the field of complex numbers. So now we define the notion of length. let v be any vector in v the length of the vector v or also sometimes called the norm of v written as this. This means the length of the vector v is defined to be this. Okay, so let us now see what this means. So you have any vector v in the inner product space v. Then from the definition of the space itself, you know that the inner product of v with itself, this value is a non-negative real number. Regardless of what the underlying field is, the underlying field may be the field of complex numbers and this vector v is any vector in v in our space, but still this inner product will be a real number and that too a non-negative real number, it won't be negative. And we know from our basic real analysis that such real numbers have square roots. Two square roots, uh, I mean each one of them has, among them there is a non-negative square root, which we of course denote by this usual root radical notation. And this exists and it itself is a real number and it is also non-negative. So that means for every vector v in an inner product space, you are getting uh, its length a non-negative real number, which is what we expect. Negative lengths or non-real complex lengths do not make any sense. So this is the definition of the length of a vector in an inner product space. Okay. Now there is this uh, technical lemma after this. Let us see what that is. If u and v are two vectors in the inner product space v and alpha and beta are two scalars and capital F is of course either R or C, then The inner product of alpha u plus beta v with again alpha u plus beta v, same vector, will be equal to alpha times the complex conjugate of alpha times the inner product of u with itself 
plus alpha times the complex conjugate of beta times the inner product of u with v plus the complex conjugate of alpha times beta times the inner product of v with u and there is one more term beta times its complex conjugate times the inner product of v with itself it's a technical lemma but it's something that we will need and also something that uh, once you know but uh, once you prove this you can then later use it whenever you have such thing such an inner product which you have to uh, sort of expand in this way and in uh, proving this we have to keep in mind that we cannot use any uh, anything other than whatever we have in the definition of an inner product space that is those three properties only are with us right now and we are allowed to use only them do not forget that the inner product space v can be any kind of vector space so we are not necessarily in the 3d space and this inner product may not be the ordinary dot product that we are familiar with from vector algebra no that may not be the case so let's see the proof we have so we of course start with this alpha u plus beta v comma alpha u plus beta v so the first step of course is the one in which you uh, split this one split the sum that is there in the first part the first coordinate or the first vector and that we can do directly from one of the axioms for our inner product space that is what i'm saying here is this alpha times u comma alpha u plus beta v plus beta times v comma alpha u plus beta v and this fact follows directly from one of the axioms we do not need anything else for this this one however cannot be calculated directly because we do not have uh, anything in the axiom that looks like this so what we do we have something else no? we can change the uh, Order. that is we can interchange these two vectors at the expense of one to, to have this one here and you there we would have to supply a complex conjugate and here we are of course using that thing say your uh, Say you have two vectors mu and nu the inner product of them in this order and the one in the opposite order are related to each other by this relation now so that's what we have used here again you can use that here also beta times alpha u plus beta v comma v Now inside these complex conjugate bars, horizontal bars, under these bars we can again of course do whatever we did there. So if you do your usual expansion you will have alpha times u comma u 
plus beta times v comma u but do not forget the complex conjugate plus like that here also alpha times u comma v not carefully that uh, there we have u here we have v plus beta times v comma v now by elementary properties of complex conjugates we know that complex conjugate distributes itself over addition that is uh, the complex conjugate of this sum is the sum of the complex conjugates and also like that it distributes itself over multiplication of complex numbers in general alpha beta and all these inner products are complex numbers okay so we here we are working with complex numbers although inside these symbols we have vectors from our vector space but the outermost entities are complex numbers so that means now we can write this entire thing like this alpha bar u comma u bar plus beta bar times v comma u bar plus beta times alpha bar times u comma v bar plus beta bar v comma v bar Okay, now we are almost there, alpha times alpha bar. Now in place of u comma u bar, I am just simply writing u comma u. What is the justification for that? And if we write the other things, alpha times beta bar, here, because we have complex conjugate we can remove the complex conjugate and interchange u and v by that axiom so in place of this we can write u comma v plus beta times alpha bar or let me write this one first alpha bar times beta here also we change the order and do not write the complex conjugate plus beta times beta bar here again i am just simply writing v comma v why how can i write simply u comma u here and v comma v there that's because you see our very first axiom says that for any vector u in our space this is a non-negative real number what we are using here is that this is a real number and for a real number the complex conjugate of the real number is just the real number itself that's because the imaginary part is zero that is why and now you just uh, see what what we have got alpha times alpha bar alpha times alpha bar times u comma u alpha beta bar times u comma v plus alpha bar beta times v comma u and beta beta bar times v comma v so that's it so we have proved it and this lemma now has a corollary
and the corollary is this the cor statement of the corollary is entirely in the context of the lemma so absolutely nothing is mentioned only simply the result is mentioned and that result is this the length of alpha u is equal to the absolute value of alpha times the length of u so that means here you have to understand that u is that u and alpha is this alpha that means u is some vector in our inner product space and alpha is some scalar which of course in general is a complex number so that is why absolute value makes sense because alpha is a complex number and on both sides we have besides this we have here also we have length which is we have already seen a non-negative real number this one is also a length so it's a non-negative real number this one is of course also a non-negative real number due to the presence of absolute value now we have to prove this by lemma 4 for uh, that means that one we have let us consider uh, instead of considering just the length let's consider the square of that length because the original formula of length involves square root so taking square we will just have the inner product so by definition what is this this is nothing but the inner product of alpha u and alpha u itself but note that this alpha u can be written as this alpha u plus beta 0 and now in place of this we can use this formula now if we just simply use the formula what shall we get alpha times alpha bar times u comma u plus alpha times beta bar times u comma zero plus alpha bar times beta times 0 comma u plus beta beta bar times 0 comma 0 equal to now alpha alpha bar because alpha is a complex number alpha alpha bar is nothing but the square of the absolute value of alpha we already know these things from uh, elementary complex number uh, theory i should not say complex number theory but from elementary complex analysis and just like this square is alpha u times alpha u u comma u is the square of the length of u so it seems like we are almost there this is equal to this times this so you take the square root and get uh, the desired result but that means we need these things to be zero are they zero if so why what is the justification for that this of course is zero oh and one more thing why is this zero let let us just first of all justify that itself why is this inner product zero we don't know what beta is if you want you can't uh, well if you want to make things even simpler than this you can in fact take beta itself to be zero and v to be just anything else that would make things much simpler but still say i have considered beta to be one and this to be zero that also works but then do I get this 
equal to 0, this equal to 0, this equal to 0. How? Let's see. So do you get my point here? To get the job done, I could have just simply taken beta itself to be 0. Then I will just simply have, directly have this because uh, beta is 0, its complex conjugate is 0. So these terms would, would vanish. But still, uh, say beta is not, not 0, then we are left with these things. Now they will be 0 half. If we use beta equal to 0 just for the sake of avoiding this type of complication but that is simply running away from an understanding so it will not help us in the long run so let's now first of all see why exactly is this equal to 0 you do understand that this 0 is not complex number 0 this is the zero vector from our inner product space. You recall the that axiom which tells us that this is equal to zero if and only if u is equal to zero. It is from this axiom that we have this. If u is zero, then the inner product is 0. But what about this? Say, or uh, let me first uh, justify this one. Say 0 comma u. Uh, how is this 0? Here u of course may be non-zero, still it will be zero, but why? That is because you see, we can write it like this. And now using again one of the axioms in the definition of our inner product space, this will be zero comma u plus zero comma u. Now what you are looking at is an equation involving in general complex numbers where one complex number is equal to twice that complex number. So the complex number has to be zero or you can view it this way also. You cancel it from both sides and have this equal to zero. But now if this is zero, its complex conjugate will also be zero. And that gives us this. Which is 0. But if we use that other axiom where we can interchange the vectors, get rid of the complex conjugate, then this becomes u comma 0. So that way u comma 0 is also equal to 0. So that means in any inner product, if at least one of the vectors is zero, then the inner product value is zero. And this is not an axiom. This is a consequence of the axioms. But anyway, we now have zero. So we have this. This implies So now what you do, you take non-negative square roots on both sides and one more thing, note carefully, the squares vanish and we get what we want because all these factors, all these quantities are non-negative real numbers. That's why we can take square roots on both sides and remove the squares. If one of them is negative, then it would not work. Do you know why? You see, say you uh, 
considered this identity this is true right both sides are equal to one but say someone does cannot see that the this for example is minus one it is negative and just simply blindly takes square root and gets rid of the squares that would give the person one equal to minus one which of course is wrong so that's why when we take square root if we are really not sure that the bases are non-negative then after taking square root we supply them with absolute value that keeps things intact here however we know that this is a length so it is non-negative this one is the length that is also non-negative and this one also is an absolute value so it is non-negative so that's why we do not further have to take absolute values or even if you take it just simply comes down to this so that's why this implies And that's what we uh, expect also from our um, prior knowledge of these things in three, uh, with three-dimensional vectors. If you, for example, um, have a vector, say, I'm just simply saying geometric vectors, okay? Say you have one vector, u, here. And say you have another vector that is twice the length of u and which is just simply 2u then the length of 2u according to what we already know about uh, ordinary 3d vectors should be equal to 2 times the length of u and that's what we have got of course with some other modifications because in general we are dealing with complex numbers not necessarily real numbers so that can be an interpretation of this equation okay so now we are going towards something called Schwarz inequality or squares inequality in which we will of course need these things but before we state and prove the actual Schwarz inequality we will need a preliminary lemma about quadratic expressions so let's do that first And that is going to be this uh, lemma 442. So, what this lemma says is this if A, B, C are real numbers. Such that A is positive and this quadratic expression A lambda square plus 2B lambda plus C is non negative. For all real numbers lambda if these things are true if we our hypothesis is this then p square is less than or equal to sc this is the conclusion Let's just go through the hypothesis once more. Three real numbers are given. One of them, uh, A is positive. And 
this expression is non negative for all real numbers lambda so this is a very stringent condition this quadratic expression in lambda is non negative whatever your real number lambda may be it is given that this is non negative so this condition actually means infinitely many such inequalities are given to you for every real number lambda there is one inequality which shows that this expression is non negative then b square has to be less than or equal to sc so let's now prove it it's very easy things become easy when uh, the hypothesis is this strong then uh, the consequence is just simply it drops out as a consequence okay so now for any real number lambda we have so in the beginning itself we use this hypothesis 0 is less than or equal to a lambda square plus 2b lambda plus c now we are going to uh, do something to this expression what we do is this a times lambda square plus 2 lambda times b divided by a plus b square divided by a square plus c over a minus b square over a square let's see if whatever we have written here is correct or not a lambda square we have a lambda square a a this a and that a cancel out and you are left with 2b lambda these two terms of course cancel out and a times c over a gives you c and keep in mind that since a is positive the so a is non zero so these a's in the denominator are justified and now you can of course see that the first three terms give you a perfect square so that gives you what lambda plus b over a whole square and now if you manipulate these things a little bit you have a square so ac minus b square in the numerator and this if you again multiply uh, back these things with by a you get a times lambda plus b over a whole square plus ac minus b square over a so now you see that this expression is greater than or equal to 0 for all real numbers lambda and now we can choose one very special value of lambda lambda equal to minus b over a for that lambda also this should be true in particular for lambda equal to minus b over a we have zero less than or equal to if you have that lambda value here the first term vanishes and you are left with only this minus b square over 
a or because a is positive non negativity of this quotient depends entirely on the numerator that is the numerator itself has to be non negative which tells us what it tells us that ac should be greater than or equal to b square or b square is less than or equal to ac so that's how we have our inequality so it has been proved and now we go to the statement of uh, schwarz inequality it's a very important result that's why it's being called a theorem and not a lemma a theorem is a result a lemma is also a result but a theorem is more important than a lemma so uh, the author of course uh, uh, mentions that this is called schwarz inequality but i'm going to just write it here and the statement is this if u and v are any two vectors in an inner product space v then the absolute value of the inner product of u and v is less than or equal to the length of u times the length of v this is schwarz inequality and let's now see the proof of it okay so the uh, in the beginning of the proof we deal with uh, that case where say u is the zero vector if u is the zero vector then this inner product becomes zero so see that that's why we uh, did those things there if one of the vectors is zero then the inner product is zero so its absolute value of course will be also zero and again if u is zero then its length is also zero because in that case the length is just this and this inner product is zero so that's why this product is also zero so that means when u is zero we have equality which of course also means we have this inequality because in this inequality we have the um i mean uh, we can have the strict inequality or just the equality so we have equality in this case that provision is there so that means now we can assume that u is a non zero vector okay now it may or may not happen that this inner product of u and v is a real number so let us see what happens if it is a real number if this is a real number then Oh, uh, shall I be able to continue that long a statement? Uh, let me instead write like this.
let's assume that this is a real number so i can end the statement here itself and then work with this assumption then for any i have space here na any real number lambda so you know you understand where we are going with this so for any real number lambda 0 is less than or equal to um uh, is it lambda u plus v or u plus lambda v actually it does not matter but let's take lambda u plus v okay now before i write something else you just uh, see if this is true this is of course true because it is it coming from one of the axioms in our inner product space if you take the inner product of any vector with itself that is a non negative real number so you have this inequality and note that this is true regardless of what lambda is because after all we have lambda u plus v one vector and that same vector whatever the value of lambda may be that's why we have written for any real number lambda and now let us uh, break that down using what we already know i mean that lemma so using that lemma what shall we get actually you get lambda lambda bar right but that is for general complex numbers alpha and beta here we know that lambda is a real number so that's why we will instead have lambda square times u comma u plus again lambda um lambda times 1 one bar actually but that just simply is lambda u comma v plus lambda times v comma u that is you take this one and this one and one more term v comma v now the assumption that this is real can be used how you see that because this is real so that means if you take its complex conjugate that will also be the thing itself the number itself so what i'm trying to say here is this let me do it here in place of v comma u i can write in general what can i write i can write this no but because i know that this is real so this will be equal to just u comma v so in other words if your inner product is having a real value for some two vectors say then you can just simply interchange the vectors the values will be absolutely the same so here you just have u comma v itself so that and this gives you two times this now if we uh, write things in a proper manner so that we can use it let me write u comma u first plus 2 u comma v lambda plus v comma v okay 
Now, do you see how this one looks like the previous lemma? You have a quadratic expression again in lambda, where now uh, you just compare this with this one a lambda square plus 2b lambda plus c. Here also this quadratic expression is greater than or equal to 0 just like this one is greater than or equal to 0 in that lemma for all real numbers lambda for all real numbers lambda but keep in mind the hypothesis or the I mean what the ingredients were in that case a b and c they were real numbers do we have real numbers here this is already a real number this is also already a real number and we know in fact more that both of them are non-negative that comes from the axiom itself but this is not always a real number but we have assumed that to be a real number so our a is a real number b is a real number because we have assumed that c is of course also a real number but something else is also there no? that we need we need a to be greater than zero now our a is greater than or equal to zero but will it be strictly greater than zero it will be and that's where this condition comes into play you see one of the axioms tells us that this is equal to zero if and only if u is equal to zero but our u is non-zero so that means this is also non-zero so combine this with this inequality and you get a to be strictly greater than 0. So from that previous lemma we now have the inequality that b square is less than or equal to ac and that this is lemma 4 4 2. Let me write the justification here. Since u is not equal to 0, we have this. Also, this is real. So by lemma 442, b square is less than or equal to a c. Well, we cannot of course write b square. What is our b? This. Our a is this and our c is this. Hence, now you take square roots on both sides and because uh, ordinary uh, non-negative square root function is increasing, its graph is like this, no, it increases as the input increases, the output also increases. So it, uh, the inequality will remain intact. But when we take square root again, just uh, remember what I was saying back there. If you do not know that your base is positive or non-negative, then you have to supply the, uh, I mean, uh, you put one uh, set of bars, you have absolute value. Here, however, we know that these are non-negative, real numbers, because that comes from axiom. So, on this side you can just simply take ordinary square root here also we are taking square root but because we have square we can get rid of that 
but keep in mind we have to have these things and this is just the length of u times the length of t so you have your parts inequality but it's not the end of the story it depends on this assumption that u comma p is real now we have to handle that case where it is not necessarily real now let us consider the case So that means if this is real, then we have proved Schwarz inequality, and we will use that this fact. Now let us consider the general case. where this is not necessarily real it may be real may not be real we do not know in general it's a complex number okay let so let's give it a name say we call it alpha so this complex number whatever it may be say so this is alpha there is nothing to prove if alpha is equal to 0 i mean what what is our ultimate aim our ultimate aim is to prove this inequality now if this value is zero then the inequality is automatically true because on this side you just have non negative real numbers so it's automatically true if alpha is zero so let alpha b non zero then we can consider these two vectors and consider their inner product so what i do or what the author has done is that he has divided or multiplied u with 1 over alpha the um, reciprocal of alpha and v now if one calculates this inner product what does one get you just again use one uh, one of those axioms so that gives you 1 over alpha times u comma v i hope you understand which one we are using it's that one which tells you this alpha u plus beta v comma w is alpha times u comma w plus beta times v comma w that one where here we do not have this part we just have this part and in place of b we have in place of w we have v okay but what you see here is nothing but alpha itself so that means its value is 1 right hence so its value is 1 means what now you are looking at two vectors one is u over alpha and the other one is v such that their inner product is real and for that we already have proved cauchy i am mean, sorry schwarz inequality so hence by what we 
have proved above we can just use the inequality for these two vectors so what shall we get if we do that we get this but this gives us what this of course we already know is 1 and this uh, you in place of this you can write this and here in doing so we are using that uh, corollary to lemma 441 which allows us to take the absolute value of the scalar outside and then write the length of the remaining vector. And now because your alpha is of course non-zero because th uh, that's why we are uh, able to have alpha and, uh, at the ground level or say in the basement. So you can multiply on both sides by the absolute value of alpha and have this. Now you write what alpha actually is. So again you have got first inequality but now this is not necessarily real. It's just a general complex number alpha. Now in this part, uh, I mean this part uh, I right now I uh, understand it differs a little from what we have in the text because in the text I believe if I'm remembering correctly the author considers this case to not be the general case but the case where alpha is not real. It's a non-real complex number. So from that assumption itself, it follows that alpha is non-zero because zero is real. So then he proceeds. Here, however, I did not proceed like that. So I had to consider this alpha equal to zero case separately. But anyway, we have the result. So this is your proof of sparse inequality. Now this is an important inequality and let's now see how this inequality looks into familiar inner product spaces. One of the spaces is our n double space. The space of say if depending on whether f is real or complex field the space of all n dimensional real vectors or the space of all n dimensional complex vectors and where say u is this vector and v is this vector and the inner product of u and v is given by this formula which we discussed previously also. Then the Schwarz inequality looks like this or rather uh, what I am going to write will be the one that we get by taking squares on both sides. So then
this will be less than or equal to this expression this sum times this sum so in this space first inequality looks like this which you may have seen in some places uh, this same inequality which is an inequality involving complex numbers in general and if the things are real numbers then this uh, complex conjugates will not be there and there is this other space space of continuous functions they are also the first inequality has its special form So here V is the space of continuous complex valued functions on the closed unit interval and be uh, with the well known operations of course for two functions f and g their inner product and in defining the inner product of course uh, f of t and g of t have been written but if you want you can write f and g just simply that to be this integral In this space with this inner product, the same inequality would look like this. This will be less than or equal to. Now looking at the form of this inequality, does it remind you of something that the product of two things cannot be less than some fixed something? Just think of it something from physics looks like this Heisenberg's generalized uncertainty principle or general uncertainty principle I forgot what it's called that if you have two observables then they cannot be roughly what it says is that they cannot be uh, simultaneously measured with high accuracy and the mathematical expression involves some inequality of this form where on this side you have some fixed uh, number involving Planck's constant or something and on this side you have the values of the variable actually not uh, values because 
uh, observables are uh, measured using some kind of operator some things are there okay i don't know precisely but in proving that uncertainty principle this inequality is actually used that is why it looks like this but anyway that is not our concern i just wanted to mention this fact after this we have of course the notion of uh, orthogonality two vectors being perpendicular to each other and say you are given a subspace in an inner product space is orthogonal complement then what is the relationship between the subspace and its orthogonal complement these are the things that come next and we are going to see these things in the next vector space update and our next video is of course this coming friday and friday let's let's do calculus once again so with that i wrap things up for tonight so see you on friday with calculus until then this is me lucifer from a mathematical room have a nice day